everyone. I'm Gary Knoll. This is the Progressive Commentary Hour. Today, our topic for the entire hour, the plight of Palestinians and American denialism. My guest, Abby Martin. She'll be speaking with us uh, from California. Abby is one of our leading international voices among younger American journalists and media analysts and activists. She is the host of the investigative documentary news program, The Empire Files, that was aired on Pan-Latin American Network, Telesur TV English. The Empire Files features hard-hitting investigative history and insights into subjects ignored by mainstream corporate media. Earlier, Abby was the host of Breaking the Set on Russian Today Network. She's a founder of the organization Media Roots, that supports citizen journalism and serves on the board of the Media Freedom Foundation, which manages Project Censored, which airs on the PRN network. Recently, she was released, or she has released, a break, uh, a breakthrough documentary. It's called Gaza Fights for Freedom, which puts viewers on the ground to witness the atrocities committed by Israeli military personnel against Gazans during their Great March of Return. The full feature film can be viewed on Vimeo, that's V-I-M-E-O, and Empire File episodes can be viewed at TheEmpireFiles.tv and YouTube. Abby's personal website is abbymartin.org. Nice to have you with us, Abby. Hello, Abby, are you there? Hello. Sorry about that. I had my my microphone muted. It's an incredible honor to be on, Gary. I'm so happy. Thank you. We might remember that the United Nations several years ago published their forecast that the Gaza Strip would be unlivable for human beings by the year 2020. What choices do Gazians really have? A recent quote worth noting from radical right-wing Israeli defense minister, Minister Lieberman, quote, you have to understand there are no innocent people in the Gaza Strip. Everyone has a connection to Hamas. Those who are trying to challenge us at the border and breach it belong to Hamas's military wing, end quote. And there are Israeli voices that oppose the occupation, and the Israeli security forces act as, as a enforcer. Israeli historian uh, Sternhal wrote, the weekly killing on the Gaza Strip border is a campaign of barbarism, exposing the mentality of the society in which, well, you name the acts, we can do anything like this, we can do anything we want, end quote. Really? Doctors Without Borders released a report this week that among the 7,400 Palestinians shot or wounded during the march, half have open bone fractures like from the exploding bullets used by IDF soldiers, and now 1,000 of those have severe bone infections that are becoming near impossible to treat. You wanted to tell the story, a story that I'm not aware of any other media in the United States either choosing to tell or having the courage to tell. So please take us on a tour of this. We're going to also uh, listen to some of the clips mm -hmm. from the documentary, and uh, you'll explain the context of these clips. So the forum is yours. Take us on this unique journey that you experienced and the plight of the Palestinian people. Absolutely, Gary. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, um, very harrowing introduction at that. The story starts in 2016. Of course, it starts in 1948, right? But, but my story with the issue starts in 2016 when my partner, Mike Preisner, and I, producer and co-writer of The Empire Files, went to the occupied West Bank and just saw with our own eyes, you know, the dehumanization and kind of extreme military brutality that's imposed on Palestinians living in the West Bank. We're talking about, you know, 2.5 million Palestinians that live in this occupied territory, a territory that we're told by the international community is what would be the second state, is what would be that Palestinian state. Now, while we were there, it was very obvious to us, and I think anyone who even just looks at the partitioned map of those four quadrants that sees the, the eroding land over the decades since, you know, of course, the Oslo Peace, Peace Accords. Um, but anyone who understands 
what the reality is on the ground sees that there is no second state to be had, that it is completely atomized by illegal settlements. Um, and so you would literally just be going from speckled dot to another speckled dot um, to try to bridge these territories together. Now, of course, this is aside from the fact that they're under extreme military rule. Um, we're talking about a, a martial law. You know, you can't convene in groups of five or more. You can't hold a Palestinian flag. You can't be a member of a political party. That's just the basic rules under this this legal system. Um, and you can't have weapons. That's that's certainly true. And you know, that's not the same for the settlers who go and you know move on top of these Arab villages and firebomb them and go and just spray bullets and, and just kind of waltz around with these AK-47s uh, around them. That's just the West Bank. But it's important to understand the context of the West Bank because today we're Israeli elections. You know, today Israel is holding elections that is denying 5 million Palestinians that it controls in every aspect of their lives, um, denying them the right to vote. Now, Gary, we're told that this is the greatest democracy in the Middle East. Um, how, how is that compatible with that notion? So there's 2.2 million Palestinians living in the West Bank. Now there's 2.5 million Palestinians living in Gaza. Half are children. This is a war on kids. That's who we're killing and shelling. And I, and I say we because Americans are sponsoring these atrocities with $10 million every single day. Now my story was seeing this with my own eyes. We wanted to get into Gaza to tell this story. We were denied on the premise that I was a propagandist, not a journalist. I was denied on the premise that I was an Iranian agent. I, I thought I was, a, I was a Russian agent, so I was surprised to learn that um, from the Israeli government um, issuing me you know, that denial. So we worked with journalists inside Gaza trying to figure out how could we tell their story, how could we depict daily life in Gaza, their plight, and expose the siege for what it really is. Um, and, you know, and you can't understand how the Great March got started with, of course, not understanding what life is like in Gaza um, on a daily basis. And so, you know, let's just talk about the water crisis alone. As you mentioned, the World Bank and the UN have, have said that by 2020, Gaza will be completely uninhabitable due to lack of water alone. Anyone who knows the situation knows that it's uninhabitable today. Um, 97% of all fresh water in Gaza is toxic. It's poison. 25% of all diseases in the Gaza Strip are directly caused from that contaminated water. Desalination plants are non-existent. They've been bombed. They've been destroyed. They're unable to rebuild because Israel controls the construction material that comes in and out of the territory. You cannot leave. They are denying the basic human freedom of movement, the basic human freedom of having a dignified life, having basic mobility, having medical treatment when you're dying, when you have cancer, when your leg is about to be amputated and you need to travel to save your limbs. That's being denied. So all of these things put together, and of course, electricity, right? Electricity is as important as the air we breathe, as Ahmad Faraz told us in the documentary. He says, people don't understand. This isn't about charging electronics. This is about living. This is about keeping food cold. This is about freezing meat. We can't live. We can't live with the siege. So when you take all those things into account, Gary, and of course, the constant shelling and bombardment and collective punishment, the shelling of neighborhoods, the carpet bombing of children. Half our children, we have to remember that. 75% of Palestinians living in Gaza were deported there as refugees, ethnically cleansed from their own land that they can see with their own eyes that they can't go back to. So when you couple those things together alongside Trump's declaration that Jerusalem belongs to Israel, which was a stake in the heart for millions of Palestinians who hold Jerusalem as that sacred place that the majority of them can't go to because they're prevented from traveling there. When you couple all those things together, it sparked the interest for a mass march, a mass movement of civil disobedience, of nonviolent, peaceful action, of tens of thousands of Palestinians joining together to participate in this action. And what did they do? 
we always hear the misnomer that Gaza has a border, right? That, that, that Hamas is this monolithic entity that rules Gaza, and that everyone living in Gaza, as you mentioned, is a terrorist, and they all, they're all collectively punished, and they're all kind of painted in this cartoonish fashion. Well, that's not true. Um, Gaza is completely, completely controlled, air, land, and sea, uh, air and land, by the Israeli military. You know, they, they wanted Hamas to take over, so then they can completely designate um, them as a hostile territory and justify everything they do to them. But there's no border. There's an artificial separation fence that's heavily militarized, and that is, is separating the Palestinians from the land that they were ethnically cleansed from. So what Palestinians did, and, and again, this had nothing to do with Hamas. There's a multitude of political factions in Gaza. There's Fatah, there's the PFLP, which is the Communist Party. They have a lot of strength there. There's even parties that are more conservative than Hamas. Than Hamas. But that's aside from the fact that this march had nothing to do with the political parties on the ground. This march had everything to do with artists, poets, activists, families, Palestinians of all stripes, getting together as a unit, um, participating in what was largely a symbolic action that started on March 30th of 2018, um, which they wanted to recreate their struggle as refugees, because we're talking about a peoples who have been refugees for 70 years, who have been denied the right to return to their land, who have been seized in an open-air prison. They wanted to remind the international community that we're still refugees, that we are a people without a land, without a home, they hold up their keys. They say, please, let us, let us return to our land. Let us, let us have the freedom of movement. So what they did, Gary, on March 30th of 2018, they went in the tens of thousands, pitched tents in the open land across from this artificial separation fence to, to draw attention to their plight as refugees in a peaceful fashion with bared chests facing down a fortified military. And what did this military do in response? They could not have a victory for the Palestinian people. They could not have a political victory for them. So they mowed them down with Israeli snipers perched up on the hilltop starting at 9 a.m. that same day. They mowed them down. They mowed them down, civilian after civilian. And, and, and so once this happened, once I realized that every Friday they were going to go out there in the masses go out there and face down this, this military with bare chest. And when I realized that every Friday they were going to get mowed down by sniper fire, I knew this is a story that needs to be told. The media is not telling a different story. The media continues to say the passive voice, Palestinians died. Who killed them? Who, how are they dying? They're being murdered. You know, 75% at least of the people who have died in 2018 alone, we're talking about 200 unarmed Palestinians who've been mowed down by sniper fire, 75% were shot in the head or torso. That's clearly a murder shot. And what this documentary does, Gary, as I saw week after week, throngs of Palestinians getting killed with no differentiation in the way that the Western media was covering it. I knew we had to do not only an Empire Files episode, but a full documentary piece on this tragic story that was being missed and outright censored. And so I worked with, with a team of Palestinian journalists on the ground who, who begged us. They said, can you please tell the story accurately? They risked their lives every Friday to go out there. And I wanted to give a shout out to Moaz Maza and Asma. Um, Atiyah Hamad, who risk their lives every Friday to get this, this footage because it is the most mind-blowing, incredible footage I have ever seen. It makes you feel like you're inside these protests. You really, truly experience the humanity of who the most dehumanized people in the entire world have been. You understand that they're human beings. They're our brothers and sisters. They just want freedom. They just want a life. And how dare the media say otherwise. And so once we saw this footage, we knew we had to do it justice. We knew we, knew we had to do the story justice. We wanted to put it together in a full-length film, telling their story, telling Razan al Najjar's story, the young feminist medic, the first female medic who was out there changing society. A feminist leader got gunned down and killed by Israeli snipers on June 1st, 2018. We knew we wanted to tell her story fairly. Because the way the media was covering that was that it was a mistake. They let Israeli generals explain why she was no more than a human shield for Hamas's goals. 
So that's where the, that's where this whole story came from. That's where the <clears throat> movie came from. And and as we know, Gary, the march is still going on. Every week, people are getting killed. And what this movie does is it, it focuses on those protected categories from the Geneva Conventions, which which we'll get into once we play one of these clips, which really breaks down the illegal nature of of, of you know the targeted killings that that are going on, and even in a battle of armies it would still be considered grievous war crimes. So, you know, in a nutshell, <laughs> that's, that's how this all happened, and we just hope that this movie can really push the needle of accountability um, for, for this apartheid state. I appreciate your opening argument. Um, there is something that we seem to be remiss with in the United States. There are certainly exceptions, but there are probably no more than 5% who are living consciously and intentionally becoming aware of issues involving people outside the United States. As an example, Save the Children just told us that 85,000 children in Yemen have died of starvation. 85,000 in the last uh, four years that the Saudi Arabians, along with the United Arab Emirates and other Middle Eastern countries and, and the United States supplying the intelligence, boots on the ground, blocking the port so that uh, nothing gets in the way of supplies, the people are simply starving to death. We're talking about 19 million people susceptible to dying and of starvation, and yet the American media for three and a half years never covered it, never covered it at all. So the American media not at all has covered the plight of people who are in impossible situations, including those living on the West Bank. And the simple retort is, well, they're all Hamas, and therefore we must stop them or they will harm Israelis. Now, no reasonable person wants to see any Israelis harmed. All of us want peace and prosperity for both the Palestinians and the Jewish people. And as radicalized as some Hamas members have been in the past and are today, you have equally that number or more of radicalized um, settlers and members of the Likud and even the Knesset who don't represent all Israelis who insist that this is the right thing. In the United States, all of our legislators have signed letters of support and allegiance to Israel. In fact, even, even people like Elizabeth Warren uh, is pro-Israeli. Uh, Bernie Sanders made a, made a whiff but didn't really come out and condemn Israel for what has happened to innocent uh, Palestinians and demanding a two-state resolution or stopping the funds going to Israel. So you have our entire U.S. Senate and House of Representatives and the White House going clear back to Henry Tr uh, Harry Truman supporting Israel unconditionally. Give us your explanation before go to a clip of why we have not had any critical and honest and objective journalism except for Chris Hedges and Max Mumenthal and uh, a handful of journalists who had the courage to tell the truth about what is actually occurring in Israel. It's a really great question, Gary, and I think we all know the answer, that it's a third rail issue um, for journalists and politicians alike. One has to look no further than what's happened to Elon Omar for simply saying that the Israeli lobby influences people with money. I mean, what kind of society are we living in when we can't talk honestly about one of the biggest lobbying forces on the Hill? So there's this misnomer because, um, you know, politicians are so subservient to Israeli policy and, and are so, you know, make it just exclaim constantly how they're dual loyalists and, and they love Israel till the day they die. You have Cory Booker actually saying he'd cut his right hand off than to abandon Israel. That's what he'd rather do. What kind of sick person says that, Gary? Why are all these Democratic politicians giving credence to the notion that there can be a two-state when they know very well that there hasn't been a second state possible for so long? They're giving... It, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. So what we saw with Elon Omar, I think, is a, is a really emblematic kind of portrayal of the rollout of charges of anti-Semitism to anyone who dares question the legitimacy of Zionism. 
because it comes at the expense of, of course, like I said, those 5 million Palestinians who are left out of the picture. That's not tenable. It's not a feasible state. Israel cannot survive in the sense that it is um, for much longer. It's getting more increasingly fascistic. So, I mean, you look back in the 90s, there was actually a a solution. There was a a two-state solution possible. There was a peace process that was uh, that, that had optimism surrounding it. But Israel stood flagrantly in violation of international law. I mean, they have since their creation. Um, so I've had the experience as a journalist getting accused of anti-Semitism my entire career for daring to humanize Palestinians and question the war crimes that Israel is committing. So I, I, I know firsthand how much this can disrupt your career. Um, it comes to a point where you have to say, I don't care. I don't care about losing my job because I have a moral compass and I have ethics guiding my journalism. But a lot of people won't go there, Gary, because it's not worth the risk. Now, I can say the exact same thing about U.S. politicians. We know how lobbying works. It's not necessarily that APAC is paying someone, you know, a million dollars and saying, now you have to be unabashedly pro-Israel. It's that they can pay for opponents. They can pay smear campaigns, just like the NRA, just like the NRA, I mean, they make your life a living hell if you don't support the NRA because they will fund your opponents' careers. They will fund hit campaigns, ads against you in swing states, in key districts to make you seem like an anti-Semite. And it doesn't even have to be about Israel. It doesn't even have to be about guns. They'll pick another issue. So we know by, by just that Al Jazeera documentary, which was heavily censored, called The Lobby, the lengths that they are willing to go to control the narrative. And that's really where Israel is be- hedging all of its bets, is controlling the narrative. They have Hasbro war rooms set up in Tel Aviv, editing Wikipedia articles on a daily basis. So I think that what we're seeing in the last 10 years as polls are showing a dwindling amount of support a- among Democratic and Republican voters for this kind of staunch allegiance with the U.S. and Israel, because they're seeing the truth with their own eyes. They're seeing these images from the ground. They're seeing, you know, the flotilla, the commandos going on the flotilla and killing nine peace activists. They're seeing the Baker boys on the beach getting bombed. They're seeing what's happening in 2014. You can't deny these things anymore. As much as the media won't waver, as much as the media refuses to tell the truth about the story, people are waking up and social media is changing the game. It is perplexing that in 2019 we can still pretend like you know, like, like that's a different situation, right? And you mentioned Hamas, and I think this is really important to talk about Hamas and this kind of cartoonish depiction that we hear about Hamas and their charter. And yes, they did have a bad charter, and they did conflate Judaism with Israel, um, you know, back when Hamas was, was, um, came to power. And when Hamas came to power, we can't forget that, you know, WikiLeaks cables have revealed that Israel wanted Hamas to take full control of the Strip. That's, that's, they worked with Fatah um, to have Hamas win the election in, in 2006 after Israel removed its settlements and removed um, its military occupation there because they wanted to then say, well, Gaza is a hostile territory, there, therefore we can relentlessly bomb all of its inhabitants and civilians. And anyone who knows anything about Gaza, anytime civilians are killed, they're adjacent to Hamas, right? Well, you're a Hamas target if you're in Gaza, so you better get out get in the line of safety. Well, there is no line of safety in Gaza. Everyone is a Hamas target that lives in that small five by 25 mile strip of land. Now, when you look at Hamas's charter today, it's clear that they have actually gone to the negotiating table with a completely different lens than they had when they first came to power. What the Hamas charter actually says today is that they will accept a two-state solution within the international consensus of those 1967 borders. Fascinatingly enough, this is actually what Bernie Sanders has said. He's the only Democratic contender that has actually articulated what the actual two-state solution would entail. And he says the same thing. He says, let's remove settlements to the 1967 borders, let's end the occupation and end the siege. No one's talking about uh, forcefully expelling Israeli citizens. What we mean by a one-state solution with equal rights for all is that we provide reparations and resettlement processes for the Palestinians that have been denied their freedom. No one's talking about kicking anyone out of their homes. No one's talking about, you know, large-scale ethnic cleansing of then the Israelis who have resettled there. 
We're talking about equal rights, cohabitation, and coexistence. And the vast majority of Palestinians agree with that. So, again, I mean, I, I wanted to say one more thing about Hamas's charters. They actually do approach this today as a fight against political Zionism. They differentiate political Zionism from Judaism. They say this is not a fight against Jewish people. This is a fight against, you know, Zionism and the occupation. And, you know, that's, that's the view, that's the sentiment shared by Jewish Voices for Peace. Progressive, progressive Jewish organizations worldwide agree with that stance. I don't even agree with Hamas. I think there should be a one-state solution. But it just shows you that they're willing to come to the negotiating table in a way that the media refuses to entertain. Now, when you look at the other side of the coin, the Israeli elections that are happening today, what's going on? As you mentioned, there is an Israeli left, right? There are Israeli peace activists. They tried to challenge that open-fire policy in the Knesset. They were denied. Um, There's not enough leftists to change the course of where Israel is heading. That's the biggest problem today. You have 17 out of 120 elected members of the Knesset today um, that are entertaining ending the occupation, right? That's, that pretty much reflects where Israeli society is at as a whole. The vast majority of Israelis, I'd say over 80%, um, have, you know, this is depicted in polls, agree with the open fire policy on the quote-unquote border. Um, they agreed with the bombing atrocities in 2014, and they agree with the ongoing ethnic cleansing of the settler colonial state. And so even though there are kind of pittance, you know, measly measures doled out to kind of appease um, leftists and progressives, it's not enough. Just like it wasn't enough in South Africa. Whatever leftists exist there weren't enough to move the racists in power to say, hey, we need to crush apartheid. It had to come from pressure from the international community. And so what we have today in Israel, we have, a, we have an election between fascists and fascists. There's no ruling coalition parties. There's no ruling party in general that is entertaining ending the occupation, ending the siege, and providing equal rights for all. So the people who are privileged enough to cast a vote, to cast a ballot today, is choosing between Trump and Trump. It's a facade. It's a sham. And that's where we're at, Gary. Let's take a few moments now, Abby, and take a look at Gaza, Fights for Freedom, the documentary that you and your partner worked on with the cooperation of those in Gaza. I had a chance to watch it, and I must uh, tell this audience that when you see the truth being filmed and you see the one medic, uh, none of these people had arms, um, any weapons, and yet you can then hear the Israelis getting commands from their generals or their general staff to go ahead and kill people, even though those people had no weapons and, and represented no threat whatsoever. They were there to peacefully demonstrate. And then they were just shot one after another after another, and with exploding bullets, which are against international law. And... No cries from the American political community. And disappointingly, Abby, not from the American corporate Democrats either. Nothing. So we're going to take a few moments and watch or listen to a clip from Gaza, Fights for Freedom. ...finds itself at the center of international controversy, as in the past, because civilians are being killed in large numbers by an army claiming self-defense. This chapter is at the Great March of Return, which began on March 30th, 2018. At these mass marches, hundreds have been killed, thousands wounded, but they have continued every Friday, despite these deadly odds. While it occasionally makes headlines, what is rarely explored is why so many would risk life and limb in an act of civil disobedience. The Gaza Strip is only 25 miles long and about five miles wide. Two million Palestinians live packed into this tiny space, one of the most densely populated places in the world. Half are children. Many live in refugee camps speckled throughout the besieged territory. A stunning 80% of the population relies on foreign aid. Aptly called an open-air prison, there are only two ways to leave the enclosed area. The Rez crossing into Israeli territory and the Rafah crossing 
which goes to Egypt. Both are completely controlled by hostile militaries. What Israel calls a border is actually a heavily militarized perimeter fence comprised of barbed wire, surveillance networks, and lethal no-go zones. If you roam too close to the so-called no-go zone, which extends 300 meters out from the fence, Israeli forces have authorized themselves to shoot to kill. Thousands of unarmed Palestinians have been shot for violating this rule in 2018 alone. The same goes for Gaza's coastline. It is the only place in the world where you can't even flee by boat, as refugees elsewhere often do. Fishermen are restricted to only a few nautical miles from their shore. Strained past that, even by accident, you can be blown out of the water by Israeli warships. A massive seawall in the north and south, currently being extended, boxes them into their small sliver of sea. This violence is compounded by an economic blockade that imposes a chokehold of poverty on Gaza, resulting in one of the highest unemployment rates in the world, according to the World Bank. 70% of the youth are unemployed, with 52% for the general population. Those are just a few of the scenes. Let's go back for a moment in history, Abby. Let's assume that many people listening, and we're heard throughout the world. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that most of the people from other countries are more familiar with what is happening and has happened historically than most Americans. We simply take one side of the issue and that's it. There's no fairness or objectivity. But you also had done a previous program, in fact, two that I watched. One was on the history of how the Palestinians lost their country and where we uh, parade around the slogan that there was no Palestine, hence there was no Palestinian peoples, so there was no legitimacy to the right to return. And all of the terrorism, all of the violations of human rights that existed during that time of them being forced out of their homes, of whole villages destroyed, the American public had that completely sanitized. You read that in a single history book in the United States. So tell us now why we have the story today that so many people like Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram, people all over the media, including in the liberal media, they support Israel and say it's the most democratic country in the Middle East and our greatest ally. And yet Israel has done more spying on the United States than Russia ever has. In fact, um, they were just caught spying. Tell us the history so we have this context to understand what it means to live in such a small area, 20, what is it, 5 by 20, uh, yep. 4 by 25? Yep, five by twenty-five miles. No, that that's really important, Gary, because we we've heard this kind of trope that you know they've been fighting over there for thousands of years, right? Because of course we're talking about these biblical kingdoms that you know grants Israel the right, the, basically the whole foundation of why Israel is is the homeland for Jews, right? And and why it was a safe haven after the Holocaust. And we have to understand that Zionism was a political struggle and advocacy f to find a homeland for Jewish people before the Holocaust. It just became a lot more, it generated a lot more interest and support after the Holocaust, of course. Um, we also have to understand that um, there is no both sides in the issue in the way that the U.S. media and politicians portray it today. Like, they always say, oh, it's just the Palestinians and the Israelis. Again, they've been fighting over there forever, right? There is no solution. There's no easy solution. Well, when you kind of understand the power dynamic that this is about the colonized and colonizer, the oppressed and the oppressor, um, it becomes a little bit more clear what the conflict really is. Um, we're told all the time, I mean, I, we're indoctrinated from birth, let's face it, that Israel is the greatest, <laughs> one of the greatest countries in the world, the only democracy in the Middle East, and that they can do no wrong, and that they're surrounded by people who want to kill them, and they're in a really bad neighborhood, as Elizabeth Warren would say. Well, Israel was created on top of another land. Israel was created on top of another country. It was no people without a land, a land without a people. It was actually overrun by Arab indigenous habitants who lived there. 
the Palestinian people who were actually told never existed. So when you look back, yeah, you can look back at the Bible um, as giving, you know, Jewish people some historical deed that, that's based on religion. But what the actual facts of the matter is, is that, you know, there are millions of Palestinians and, and Arabs who, who lived in this area and actually coexisted with Christians and Jews. So they're, that's totally not true that they've been fighting over there forever and that this is all about religion. No, this is a settler colonial ethnic cleansing project that's ongoing to this day. I mean, imagine if we were still purging the native population here. 200 years after, you know, the massive genocide of Native Americans. That's kind of comparable to what's going on. This never stopped. So in 48, when Israel was kind of plopped down and partitioned, you know, Gaza was partitioned into this random area meant to basically just deport all the refugees that were expelled during what's now called the Nakba, which was the massive, you know, expulsion of, of millions of Palestinians that were, a lot of them were slaughtered. You know, we're talking about 500 villages that were razed to the ground. Um, a lot of those people were deported to Gaza, and that's why so many people in Gaza are refugees today. And that's why you actually see so many Palestinian refugees around the world. You know, my, my interest was piqued in this issue because I worked with a lot of Palestinians, and I thought, wow, why are there so many Palestinians, like, living around the world? And then I realized, well, there's so many of them that are refugees because of, because of the creation of Israel. And it would be different if Israel was just created and then, Palestinians were allowed to exist and have a dignified life, but we know that's not what happened. It, it was created under the condition that Palestinians would be subjugated and would be living in this kind of caste system under apartheid rule. Um, and, you know, this whole notion that Palestinians are terrorists and Hamas is this terrorist entity, what's interesting is when you look back at the creation of Israel, um, you know, just a couple of years after the Nakba and, and millions of Palestinians were, were purged, they actually implemented a law called the Prevention of Infiltration Law in 1953 that under this rule, and, and they basically called refugees trying to return or wanting to basically still live there infiltrators. So the rhetoric has kind of shifted, and, and now it's terrorists because of the Hamas thing, but back then it was infiltrators, and they still treated them the same way, where you have Israeli soldiers um, on camera and Elon Pape and Miko Pila have documented this extensively, talking about their orders to shoot to kill returning refugees, to shoot to kill, quote, infiltrators that wanted to come back to their land. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? That's exactly what's happening in, in, in Gaza. This shoot to kill policy against, quote, unquote, terrorists. It's absolutely fascinating. And, and we actually uncovered this top-secret military document on behalf of Pape and, and Pilad that literally just got discovered a couple months ago that we were able to add to the film, um, which was about the orders, the orders to, you know, to not only kill infiltrators, but to lay mines in the routes of return. I mean, imagine the inhumanity. Um, and you mentioned that inhumanity. You mentioned this kind of institutionalized um, violence and discrimination that you would have to internalize in order for it to be okay for the situation to be happening around you, in order, in order for it to be okay to shoot children, right? And that, honestly, is kind of similar to the foundation of this country. I mean, I mean, the racist roots of settler colonialism and the way that that manifests in a society in order to normalize this kind of violence. Um, and so, no, of course I don't blame Israelis. I blame the situation. I blame the fact that, you know, people are products of their own society and the, the indoctrination processes that manifest, you know, not only with the education system, but also the fact that every Israeli serves in the military. You know, that, that's really extreme. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the history goes along like that. I mean, we're told numerous falsehoods and myths about, about the foundation of Israel, but you have to look no further than the actual founding prime minister and founder of Israel himself, Ben Gurion who literally, unabashedly said, we must expel the Arabs and take their places. So this was never about, oh, let's cohabitate, let's, let's, let's live in peaceful coexistence with these people. No, it was about purging the native people on the land and taking their land. And we know that it doesn't stop with where they've taken, Gary. I mean, we know that this bleeds into Lebanon and Syria as well which kind of exposes the Greater Israel Project and, and really kind of lays bare the hypocrisy of all of this, that they're not just stopping with Gaza and the West Bank. They want more. 
They want more because that's the root and nature of settler colonialism, just like the nature of the U.S. empire. And this whole notion that Israeli, you know, Israel controls the U.S. And, I mean, it's absurd. Can you imagine this tiny speck of land in the Middle East controlling what the U.S. empire does and dictating what we do? No. Good God. I mean, it's very clear that this con- colonial project is very useful for the U.S., which is why the U.S. empire subsidizes it with so many billions of dollars on a, on a yearly basis, because it's used as a battering ram and a launching pad for U.S. imperialism to attain our goals in the Middle East. It's a very convenient location for us, meaning the U.S., um, to impose whatever military projects it wants to do in that region. For example, the fact that you know, Trump and, and, and um, Obama used, used Israel to basically bomb Assad when the U.S. didn't want to take the heat for it. So we throw out these trial balloons that we use Israel for um, before maybe incurring things ourselves militarily. So it's important to understand that power dynamic, but it's also just important to understand that the conflict is not very complicated, that that's kind of a misnomer that the media tells us so we don't really think critically about it, and that it's actually super simple to understand. Again, um, it's an ongoing ethnic cleansing project, and, and it will not stop until the international community stands up in a united sense and says no more. That's not going to happen, I believe, because France, Great Britain, and Germany, Italy, uh, and other countries are doing business with Israel. Just like the United States is not going to condemn uh, Saudi Arabia for all of its crimes against humanity, its crimes against humanity in Yemen alone, but also its support of ISIS and al-Qaeda and al-Nusra and, uh, and all the other crimes against Syria. So I don't see there being a happy outcome here, but what people do need to understand, and this will really gets it down to the, uh, to the progenitor, what it's like each day when you wake up in Gaza uh, in what amounts to a fairly classist society. In the United States, you can wake up and be David Geffen or Jeff Bezos, and mm-hmm. you, you have everything in the world that you want. You want the 450-foot yacht? Geffen has it. You want the largest? If you're a man named Griffin, you can have a $240 million uh, four-story building on Center Park South. But if you wake up in Gaza, you face a different reality every single day. Take us now, Abby, in detail, please, of what you've personally experienced and then what people you've interviewed in Gaza have told you about what it's like day in and day out, year in and decade out, so that this is not just a one-off problem for a few families. It is everyone in Gaza. Absolutely, Gary. That's really important to talk about um, because, yeah, I mean, this has been going on since the foundation of Israel to this day. As I mentioned, the millions of Palestinians that were deported to Gaza are warehoused there today. Um, and, you know, what's, what's super important to understand is, um, you know, the collective punishment aspect, because just because people elected Hamas in 2006, um, it would be akin to basically China or Russia saying, okay, let's relentlessly bomb um, the U.S. because a few million Americans elected Trump. I mean, it's as absurd to actually conceive that that would be supported by the world, right? Well, screw them. Bomb them to hell. Bomb them back to the Stone Age because some people got swayed by Trump's populist rhetoric, you know, or or maybe racism played a factor. But yeah, I mean, that's the reality of life in Gaza is that people who have nothing to do with Hamas, um, have nothing to do with any, any crimes perpetrated, any violence whatsoever. We're talking about half children who are waking up every day in Gaza without, without proper diets, without medication. You know, not to met, you know, electricity and water are obviously dire, the lack thereof. But just thinking about medicine alone, I mean, one really crazy thing that we, we kind of, you know, we, we directed these interviews and we wanted interviews with journalists who were shot, with medics who were shot, um, but, you know, it doesn't stop there. I mean, civilians being shot is still war crimes. <laughs> this is even in an armed battle between standing armies. It's illegal to just target civilians um, and, and do direct killings. 
But we're talking about protected categories under the Geneva Conventions, journalists, medics, disabled people, and children. And children. And as I mentioned, Palestinians of all stripes participated. So it was, it was a largely family affair, and it continues to be that. Um, but what we, what we got from the Palestinians that we directed these interviews were absolutely harrowing. Not only does it kind of just humanize Palestinians in a way that no other media really has, um, at least that I've seen, and just tells their stories. I mean, I was simply a conduit for the Palestinians to tell this story and amplify their voices, but their stories are absolutely heartbreaking. Um, one man, Mohammed, got shot at the march, and his leg will be amputated, Gary, because Israel prevents him from leaving. Because anyone who is associated with anyone who has attended the march, which is really a lot of people in Gaza, as I mentioned, tens of thousands of people are going out there every Friday. You can imagine that at least once you've attended. And if Israeli authorities who control who leaves and who comes and who's permitted medical travel permits to leave to get life-saving medical care, you're collectively punished. Um, there was actually an Israeli declaration after the march began that any single person associated with the march would be denied outright for medical care. So what does that mean? We hear the statistic 200 people have been killed in 2018. Um, well, what's shocking is that there have been hundreds more that were had leg amputations and arm amputations. So, uh, you know, a lot of these sniper fires are targeting the limbs and joints for the purpose of actually having amputations. And so you just see countless men, young men in Gaza, who, who have amputated legs, who are walking on crutches. Prosthetics aren't, aren't readily available. I mean, one of the Palestinians who was talking to us that we actually couldn't even put in the movie because I couldn't stomach it myself said, maggots are crawling around in our wounds because we actually can't get proper dressing for our open wounds for when we're getting shot by these exploding bullets that tear through the skin, that tear through the muscle. And a lot of these people are getting affected by just simply the shrapnel of the exploding bullets. War crime after war crime. Um, one international war correspondent that was interviewed for this UN report that we hone in on to kind of pre present kind of a time capsule of these harrowing crimes to kind of pass along and say, look, this is all the things that were documented. One, of the, one international war correspondent described the scene and just said, I've never seen anything like this. Um, I've, I've covered wars in Yemen, Syria, Iraq. She said, this is nothing like this. This is ambient crowds of stillness of people dancing, people chanting, and just every 10 minutes a shot rings out and someone else drops at the ground. And everyone says, who got killed this time? We're going to play another clip from her film, Gaza fights for freedom, and that film, by the way, puts you on the ground to witness the atrocities committed by Israeli military personnel. Now, as a, a documentarian myself, and having produced and written and directed more than a hundred films, I can tell you that what you're going to see in this film will get your attention. It is, it is dramatic. And you will feel, if you're a human being, you'll feel. Let's go to the clip until we get, uh, I'll be back. If you look at mass media, the story you find is that they fire hundreds of rockets into Israeli cities right across the border. Everything before that point is left out. Most commonly, we hear of rockets hitting the border city of Stair Road. It is home to the notorious Stair Road cinema, where settlers drink beer and eat popcorn watching bombs fall onto Gaza. Stair Rote was once called Hajj, a village that was 100% Palestinian and Muslim. Israeli historian Benny Morris uncovered that not only did Palestinian residents get along well with Jewish settlers, but they actually hid and protected them from British occupation forces in 1946, when a British army dragnet was rounding up members of a Jewish paramilitary. The Palestinians of Hajj kept them safe. It came as a shock to them when just about a year later, that same paramilitary violently expelled every single resident of Hajj. All fled to Gaza. Hajj was renamed Stair Rot, and settlers from all over the world started to move there. This is the family history of almost every current resident of Gaza, where roughly 75% of people living there are refugees from villages just outside of their border.
They were among the 500 Arab villages completely depopulated at the barrel of a gun in 1948, in what became known as the Nakba. Those who wouldn't leave their homes were killed. That year, the United Nations issued Resolution 194, which mandated that all of the 750,000 Palestinians made refugees from the Nakba had the right to return to the land they were ethnically cleansed from. From that day forward, Israel has refused in flagrant violation of international law. Displacement of okay, we have Abby back. Abby, please continue. We have about four minutes left for our program today, and I'd like to give you that opportunity to, again, go through the day in the life, not someone going to the march. You've mm -hmm. covered that very, very well. But just what it means when you cannot leave, you have no hot water, you frequently have no water, and the water you have, 90% of it is contaminated. And what that means for intestinal diseases, no medicines being allowed, and, and the lack of food, and ancient olive groves that are, some are 900 years old, have been bulldozed by the Israeli. Go through that life on a day-to-day -day basis, because I think people could relate to it. Right, and we start the movie by, by talking about just the average life in Gaza from someone named Ahmad um, Feroz, who, who was a farmer until Israeli blockade drove most farms out of business. You know, you talk about the olive trees, they're regularly raised because they obstruct the view from the Israeli military on this artificial border. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, imagine a place that's that small, right? A strip of land that's 25 miles by 5 miles wide. Um, imagine just being in that place, trapped, um, where you can see cities that you can't ever go to, that you, you're born and you're born and you're, you die um, there. Um, you know, the water and electricity, of course, is harrowing enough. I think it's really important to hone in on, on the fact that this is a manufactured crisis, um, that Palestinians living in Gaza, this wasn't just something that, that manifested naturally. I mean, this is something that's being deliberately deprived from from the people who are implementing the siege, um, you know, and I and, and can you compare this to anywhere else in the world that people can be deprived of water, right? Water and electricity, and then be told it's your fault. You're committing self genocide. Why are you doing this to yourself? That's the narrative that we hear from the media. Um, so when you just understand what daily life is like in Gaza, again, like I said in the film, why would you risk life and limb in an act of civil disobedience? Well, it comes from, like, the, the abject poverty and, and also, you know, a lot of desperation and a kind of a lot of people just saying, I am willing to die for my country. I am willing to die for freedom. It's something that Americans can't really fathom. Um, we've never had a fight like that where we, you know, that, that, that at least has been um, legitimate, right? And the freedom, you can't really say that our American military is doing anything for freedom, quote unquote, in the world. But that's what Palestinians are doing. So to understand the fact that, let's say, if you're, if you're born in Gaza, um, and if you're diagnosed with breast cancer, you have as little as 30% chance to surviving that because radiotherapy, you know, all of these, these basic medications aren't available to you. And then in your adjacent neighbors in, in Tel Aviv or in Israel proper, you have an 86% chance of surviving cancer, breast cancer specifically. So it kind of shows you this extreme disparity um, in care and the collective punishment being imposed, especially in the wake of the march, to anyone who wants to leave. You look at um, back a couple of years ago, Israel was allowing the vast majority of, of people in Gaza to leave for medical travel um, who are you know, on the brink of death to get actual life-saving care. Now it has dwindled. Every single year it dwindles and dwindles, and now it's actually below 50%. Um, and like I said before, the collective punishment of outright denying anyone who's associated with the march. So we're talking about um, lack of water. That's the big one, right? Um, so no one has any potable water. The fact that you can't survive on, you know, just one hour of electricity a day if you want to actually store food. Um, and the fact that you don't have medicine. Like you don't have dressings to dress wounds. So what all of that says, it, it kind of explains the need for the mass march. It explains the need for Palestinians to mobilize themselves and, and try to differentiate this from the mantra that they're violent peoples who want to commit terrorism. But also, 
I totally lost my train of thought, but, <laughs> but, it's, but it's just so important to understand that this is why the march happened, because of how abysmal life is like in Gaza. Oh, I just remember what I was going to say. Gaza, the unemployment rate is, is shocking, Gary. It's among the highest in the entire world. But that has not deterred people in Gaza from getting degrees. It actually has one of the highest rates of college degrees and PhDs. What does that say to me? It says that they're optimistic. They haven't given up on life. They want to live. They want a future. They have hope for their future. They want to, to go and travel and practice. And it's up to us to, to heed that call and to fight for them. People of conscience around the world must fight for that, Gary. And thank you for the time to tell this story. I really appreciate your program. Abby Martin, my guest, the film, watch the film, Gaza Fights for Freedom. You can go to Abby Martin's personal website, abbymartin.org. You can go to Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O, and then go up to Gaza Fights for Freedom so you can watch this and be moved as I was. Thank you very much, Abby. We look forward to our next conversation. Thanks so much, Gary. You're the best. Bye. Thank you all for listening. Have a nice day.